<clears throat> Close out, are you ready? We are ready, Lexi. Ah, so um, good evening, everybody, relatives, those of you joining in. Um, I don't turn my camera on because uh, our internet is very unstable here on the reservation. So if I turn on my camera, uh, you get a notice low bandwidth and then you start losing your signal. And pretty soon the person speaking sounds like they're talking underwater. <laughs> so uh, I don't turn on my camera because of that, because it, uh, it affects the uh, signal. That's something we have to live with here on the res. Uh, with we we go under Golden West and they they're they're not really, uh, I guess, really up to par with uh, the the service we get. Probably figure there's nothing out there but Indians and coyotes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of the feeling I get anyway. So anyway, um, we're going to talk about the seven sacred rites of the Lakota. So in our language, we say, Waka wichoch an shakoni. So Waka is sacred. Wichoch an is like a rite or a way of doing things. And then shakoni is seven. So um, in the beginning, um, when we roamed about, um, and one of the arguments that um, the Washichu has against us is that we, we just roamed around aimlessly and we never really called any place home. So, uh, so uh, one of the things I always tell them is that uh, the star knowledge covers a, a vast area. Um, the core of it is the Black Hills, but uh, you can extend out that star map all the way down to as far as Pueblo, Colorado, and to the west as far as Utah and Idaho, and then circling back around into southern Canada. And all the way, uh, I mean, to the north, you'll, be, you'll see right around southern Canada, the Wood Mountains area, uh, all in that place, the Cypress Hills, and then you go to the east, it's all the way to Lake Michigan. So that was our territory at one time, the Ocheti Shakoin. So um, we did not roam around aimlessly. We followed the buffalo and the buff buffalo followed the spiritual calendar. So again, as I told before, when the sun was in a certain constellation, the buffalo were at a certain sacred site. So we made our offerings uh, along that spiritual calendar. So we, we made a wide circle uh, throughout the four seasons. So there's the uh, Wanietu, the Wetu, the Bloketu, and the Ptanietu. So that's winter, uh, spring, summer, and fall. And then we started back with the winter again. So there's four the four seasons, as the Washichu call, call them. Uh, but when we name a certain season, like uh, Wani Yetu, so Wani is I live, Yetu is the time of, so the time, the time of living. Uh, and then um, Wetu is, We is like blood or the source of life, and Du is the time of, so the time of the, the time of the source of life. Um, so like that, they all have their meanings that you break the word down, then you get the meaning. So whenever Ptesami, the white buffalo calf pipe woman, the, the white buffalo calf woman came to us. Uh, she was the daughter of Wahokhbi, uh, who sent her to earth to bring the two-legged, the pipe. So with her, she brought the spiritual laws of the pipe. And also she told us of the seven ceremonies, the, the seven sacred rites. So before she came, we had two of them, which was Humblecha and uh, Inipi, uh, the sweat lodge. So we had two sacred rites. 
after she came and told us that uh, there's five more rights to it, uh, we acquired the five, but it wasn't right away. It took several hundred years to acquire all seven of them. So it, was, it wasn't something that happened overnight. So this is a picture of a Sundance in 1928 on the Rosebud Reservation. Uh, and this was the year that they allowed us to again Sundance publicly. Uh, the tribes that helped the Washichu, like the Crows and the Shoshones, they never took their ceremonies from them. They never took their Sundance. So they practiced their ceremonies because they were scouts for them. And so uh, us, they, they uh, punished us by, by putting us on land that we saw, they thought we couldn't survive. Uh, and uh, they, they also uh, took our ceremonies from us. And the Indian Offenses Act of the 1800s applied to them too, but they didn't, they looked the other way when the Crows and the Shoshones did their ceremony because, uh, because of that reason that they, they helped the uh, government to scout against us. So um, in 1928, they let us publicly do our Sundance again. So there was a Sundance here in Pine Ridge, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, 1929 but they didn't allow us to do piercing till the early 50s. So Grandfather Fools Crow uh, went to Congress and testified before Congress to allow us to uh, pierce publicly again. But in 1928, when they um, was gonna force the Indian Reorganization Act upon us, the Howard Wheeler Act, they said, if you take this law and if you if you form the tribal councils, then they said we'll allow you to have your Sundance publicly again. So it was kind of like a political blackmail. So of course we wanted our Sundance back. So we agreed to it. So that's how it was signed into law. And uh, they put it as a referendum vote among the people here and they voted for it for the simple reason that they wanted their Sundance back to be held publicly. So uh, they kind of like blackmailed us. They said, they said, we'll give you the Sundance back, but you got to accept the IRA government. Uh, but it was, it wasn't until the early 1950s when they, we publicly pierced again. So um, some, um, the lot of the young warriors were returning from the Korean War. So uh, they still had the Sundance outlawed among the Cheyennes. So these, these young men, there was uh, four of them, came from the Northern Cheyennes and danced with uh, the old men that danced here. And there was only like seven old men that danced that year, plus those, uh, those young men. And one of them uh, danced on crutches, one of the young Cheyenne men, because he was wounded in the leg. So he danced while he wore crutches. He, I mean, he used crutches while he danced. So um, that was the first... Um, uh, Sundance where they pierced. Uh, so um, it was a man named Bill Eagle Feathers. Later on, it became, he was also known as Bill Schweigman. So he was the first to publicly pierce again in modern times. And what he pierced for was in thanks to the spirits. He, he gave, made a vow during the uh, Korean War that, it, that uh, for his relatives will come home alive which they did, so uh, they uh, allowed him. Uh, so he, he was the first to pierce. So Grandfather Fools Crow went to Congress and asked him if they could pierce again. Uh, because technically that, that uh, Indian Offenses Act was still a law. So um, they allowed him to uh, pierce, but they said you could only pierce one man and we're gonna hold you liable for anything that goes wrong. If there's any infection, if there's any MRSA or any sepsis, then we're going to hold you liable for it. He said. So he said he believed in his medicine, and he told me this himself in his story, in the story of how they got it back. So he said, I told him I believed in my medicine, so I'll, I'll take the chance. So when this man pierced, uh, uh, one day he pierced, and then the next day he drug a buffalo skull. And that was the first time that was done in modern times. So uh, 
The letter is still there at the Pine Ridge Agency, allowing him, giving him permission to pierce uh, this man. Uh, and even now, to, to this day, you know, uh, people don't know that, that he, he single-handedly brought that back. Uh, and then in 1978, they had the Indian Religious Freedom Act where we can publicly uh, do our ceremonies again. So it took over close to 100 years to uh, reverse that, uh, that law that was passed by Congress. So if he were caught practicing any of the seven rites, sacred rites, or any type of healing ceremony, uh, you would be jailed. And it's a federal offense because on an Indian reservation, if you break the law, it's a federal offense. You automatically go to a federal prison. So a lot of the old men that were caught doing UEP and Luwampi and Sundance and NEP and Humblecha, they, they would arrest them and take them to Deadwood, South Dakota, and they would hold them in a federal prison there. So, so we've come through all of that, you know, to, to where we're at now. And under the threat of, uh, under the threat of incarceration, a lot of those old men secretly underground kept their uh, visions and their medicine alive. Uh, so the people were, were very protective of the holy men at one time. They never named them. They never said that person's a medicine man or this person's a medicine man. When these government agents came and asked, they would say, no, we don't know of any. So they, they kept them, uh, people hidden at that time, and which, which probably saved them. But even in that process, we lost a lot of things because, um, because they took a lot of the young people away in the early 1900s, clear into the 70s. They took the young people away and put them in boarding schools. So they weren't able to get the teachings from uh, their grandparents, like the way it's supposed to be passed down. So there's a gap there that we lost. Just very few families hung on to the teachings and continued to secretly practice uh, what they were uh, what they were doing and and teaching the younger generations that are coming up. So the reason I'm telling this story is there's some parts of these ceremonies that are missing. So. Uh, So the seven sacred rites of the Lakota Sioux from the uh, spiritual foundation of the nation formed the spiritual foundation of the, of the nation. So those, these rites are also representative of similar ceremonies and belie beliefs that crisscross uh, with each other. So uh, they crisscross many Native American and First Peoples and Nations. So here is a brief description of the Lakota rites, which are viewed by most natives, Lakota, as well as others, uh, as both powerful and critical to living a spiritually meaningful life. So that's what, uh, that means, what I just said is the, the foundation. So is the sacred rites. Uh, these, Kilena means these, Huagle Unyampi Yelo. So huagle oyampi is uh, uh, a way of saying uh, we stand on it, the foundation that we stand on. So the whole Lakota way of life, we stood on the foundation of, of these seven sacred rites. So uh, our spiritual laws are embedded inside of these ceremonies. And everything that we believed and we held sacred was inside these uh, seven ceremonies. Uh, so the right is the rights of the Lakota is different than the rituals. So so UEP is a ritual. Matko uh, bear medicine. Bear matko lowampi the bear sing. There's a they used to sing certain songs as these bear medicine men doctor. And my grandfather was one of them. American horse. He had powerful medicines and uh, he he never lost a patient uh, he 
people would come to him, warriors with horrendous wounds, with with bullets and arrows, and uh, he would uh, extract the bullets and extract the arrowheads out of them. And he never lost a patient. Every every warrior he ever doctored lived. Uh, so he was a powerful medicine man. So that's a that's a, a ritual. That's a ritual. And these other ones are are what they call rites. So the first one is um, I'm gonna talk about is uh, the keeping of the soul, Nagi Gluhapi na Nagi Nagi uh it's written there twice, but Nagi uh, is the ceremony, the ceremony of a spiritual healing performed after the death of a loved one. The rite helps the death, deceased cross over into the realm of the Nagiata, the spirit world, in peace. It is also a ceremony of closure that is used to help family, friends, and community members deal with the deceased's absence and as a celebration of his or her life. So this is how they put away their uh, mourning of uh, the loss of their relatives. So what they would do is they would braid the hair at the top, right on top, they call it, right at the, at the tip from your forehead up back like that, they, they call that cheoza. And then right there, they braid the hair. They call it a scalp lock. Um, and hey, we chop uh, right there, ashnan kisumpi, they, they braid it. So after they braid it, the hair of the deceased person, they tie a uh, sinew around the base and then then right below that base, next to the scalp, they would cut the hair, and then it would be braided down the other end with uh, down to the bottom, and then it, they'll tie the tie the uh, sinew there. So some of some of those braids were really long if this person had long hair. Uh, so that it would it would look like a, a braid of sweet grass, but it was uh, a braid of hair. So they. If it's a, a male, then they put a bundle, they put it in a bundle of either red cloth, trade cloth, or buckskin. And then inside there, they would put a braid of sweet grass and a bow, a, a miniature bow and arrow set, even with the quiver and everything. It, it will be a miniature bow and arrow set with the quiver. Uh, and then uh, they would wrap that bundle up together and then maybe something off of um, his clothing, like maybe a bead or something like that. And they would make that bundle. And then if it was a female, they would braid the hair the same way. They would cut it the same way, like a sweet grass braid. And then inside there, they would use a trahinshpa, uh, a awl that's used for sewing. Uh, so they would put a trahinshpa inside there and some trakha, some a sinew. And they would make that, uh, and some sweet grass, and they would make that bundle. So they would make a miniature teepee, and then they would place that hair inside there, which is representative of that uh, person's spirit. Because we feel that when we die, uh, when we die, the spirit um, leaves from our prewiwila, the top of our head. Uh, and if you see a baby, uh, it takes up to about three or four years for their prewiwila to close. So, uh, so naturally, that's where you would catch the spirit, because the spirit of the deceased passes through there. So, if you ever watch anybody die, uh, their eyes roll up, like and and look up like above them, like they're actually watching their spirit leave. I've, I've experienced that with a lot of my relatives, my mother and my father. Uh, so you catch the spirit in that way, and then you keep it in that little teepee, and then you uh, feed it. You have it. It has its own wooden dish and its own cup, and you feed its spirit. Whatever food it likes, uh, this person, when they were alive, you feed them. Are you feed them wasna? Are you feed them cherry juice? And then so whoever is designated the keeper of the spirit, 
uh, they have to stay home by that spirit for a whole year before they release it. So the adjustment period of losing this loved one is one year. So, um, so you go through four seasons before you have a feast, a giveaway, and you release that spirit. So that person stays by that spirit that's in that little teepee, the spirit bundle. And they feed it and they stay by it. They talk to that spirit. Uh, they don't do anything to offend it. So for, so for, for, for the year that you're keeping the spirit, this person cannot get mad. They cannot use a knife. Everything they eat, they have to bite it with their hands and eat it. Because they say when you walk saw something, you're offending the spirit of that deceased person. Um, there's no loud noises or no one can get upset around that spirit. But uh, they say that it's a big undertaking. So they used to tell people to really watch and think about it before they kept the, whoever was going to keep the spirit of their family. Uh, I mean, in their family, whoever was going to keep the spirit of their deceased, their loved ones because there can't be no controversy, no anger. They say that if you do not keep the spirit in the right way and stuff, then you're going to lose somebody there. So people had to really watch what they were doing. So when one year reached, then they would have a giveaway and they would release that spirit. And how they did that was they would tie that bundle on a stick, like a, like a short teepee pole, and then they would sing, and they would push that bundle out the top of the, the uh, teepee, the opening on the top. They would push that bundle out, and then they would pray and sing, and then they say that you they said you release that spirit. Then, so that spirit travels on the Wanavi Tachanku and reaches Nagriata, the spirit world. So uh, that was the ritual of releasing the spirit at that time. So um, that was the keeping of the soul uh, ceremony that uh, they did long ago. So they would have uh, prayers at the time they released the spirit. They would have uh, an elder talk and they would have people talk about his spirit, this man or the woman, how they were, what kind of people they were when they were alive. If he belonged to a warrior society, then they would come and they would honor him too with songs and, and they would talk about him. So the next one is the rite of purification, the sweat lodge or the inipi. So this is one of the most powerful and cleansing ceremonies. The sweat lodge ritual is designed to cleanse the spirit and to bring the participant ever closer to the great spirit, Wakantanka are to work towards the solution of a spiritual crisis. The right is common among many of our nations, always with the same general goal in mind. So what that means is with this, we lived uh, a healthy life. Uh, <clears throat> when you use this word, zaniya, or we chose zani, uh, it doesn't mean good health. It means that uh, you're, uh, you're able to bounce back from whatever hardships or life stressors you go through. Uh, so it says, so it doesn't really mean good health. It means uh, you have the resiliency to survive. So when you say mazani, you're saying, I have the resiliency to survive. Because those of us that have gone through a lot of things in our life, uh, we've lost, you know, our parents and our, in my case, I lost all my siblings and all of my aunts and all of my uncles, uh, a lot of my cousins, uh, I let, they're, they're now in the spirit were all waiting for me. Uh, so I only have one auntie left, that is my mother's cousin. Uh, so, uh, you have to be resilient to survive these things. And a lot of people yet, and you're lucky if you have your parents, your mother, your father, you haven't gone through that yet. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, 
four hardships in life, the old men used to say, and still say, the old men say, Honku gnoni piki he ata yotach ji otechike. That's the hardest uh, hardship to go, on, go through is when you lose your mother. So some of you still have your mothers. Uh, be thankful and cherish your mothers and go to them and help them. And if you're lucky enough to have your father, cherish him. Because to live in this world and to walk in this world without them is really hard. It's otechike. It's really hard to walk as a... Uh, as a uh, orphan, a wabalenicha. So when you break the word down, wabalenicha, it comes down to what it, the meaning, the real meaning is, without a sacred direction. Wa is pure and sacred. Bale is like going a certain direction, and then nicha is without. So it's without a pure and sacred direction. So a lot of our teachings in our world view. Uh, is inside the language. If you break the language down, you, the words, you get a deeper uh, meaning. And, and it's a contextual language so that when we talk, we don't exactly say everything word for word. But what we say, somebody that understands the language will catch it, will get the, the message of what they're saying, you know. We use a lot of what they call idioms in our language, like say, Washichu say, it's raining cats and dogs. You know, it's not really raining cats and dogs, but it's raining heavy is what they mean. So uh, we have sayings like that too. You know, uh, there's a lot of examples uh, that we we use that. So uh, the language is really important uh, in learning it and learning the deeper meaning of. It. So we have uh, the Inipi here, and uh, those of you that have experienced the Inipi know that the feeling of being cleansed and how good it feels when you come out, because it's not only uh, a physical cleansing, but it's also a spiritual cleansing. It's one of the few things on earth that can purify your spirit and your mind, but especially your spirit. Because if your spirit is sick, if your spirit is sick, then you'll, your body will get sick, your mind will get sick. So everything connects to the nagi, the spirit. That's what, that's our existence. When our body gets tired and plays out and we die or we catch a sickness and we die, our spirit will live on. It, it will always live on. Your spirit is like an energy. Uh, so when you come back, when you die and you come back, you can come back like in human form, but actually what is inside there is an energy. So uh, people, when they see you return, they'll see a blue light, a spark before they do, they would see a body. So uh, that's how the spirits return in the ceremonies is they come as an energy and then they can, take the human form or, you know, like that. But, but they can just come as a spark and stay as a spark and then leave as a spark because that is the core of our existence is that energy, the electricity and that energy. So um, you, re re you replenish that when you go in the Inipi. You replenish your spirit, what is inner. Uh, a lot of people that uh, become sick due to trauma or things that happen to them or even physical sickness, they say the fire, the fire in your uh, soul, your spirit is going to get weak, weak, and it'll be like a, a fire that's dying out, flickering. But this inipi, this sacred sweat lodge ceremony can replenish that again. So that's why we go back in. So I, I seen this old man one time and he was close to death and he came to my grandpa. And uh, so my grandpa took him into the sweat lodge and that man barely crawled in. He took every inch, every inch of his strength. And he, when he went in and when my uncles and my cousins sang, and, uh, each time they opened the door, he got stronger and stronger. 
pretty soon the last time they uh, opened the door right before it ended uh, he was sitting straight up and it's like he was rejuvenated and he was almost like healthy again uh, and he lived uh, several more years after that um, so this ceremony is really important this inipi uh, if you do it right it'll help you it'll heal you of, of anything the next one is the Humbalechia, crying for vision or the vision quest. Now, the vision quest is a rigorous and specialized ceremony designed to bring the participant to a new level of awareness of himself and his place in the greater world. It is considered one of the most powerful means of contacting the unseen universe and drawing oneself closer to the revelations of the great spirit. So through this way, you the grandfathers will show you uh, your your own way, who you are as a person. Uh, whenever we do, we live day to day in the common everyday world. A lot of times, it's, uh, we live a lie, or we don't really not honest with ourselves and with people. But up there on that hill, when you're up there and you're suffering and you're thirsty and you're hungry, then the real you comes out. You really, you really know who you are then. You, you, you can't fool yourself up there and you can't fool people and you can't fool the spirits. So uh, when you go up there, you become completely aware of yourself. So when I first went on a humblecha, my uncle took me and he said, he said, I was, I was to stand three days and nights. So he said, in the first night, he said, pray and walk in a circle inside your altar. So I had my pipe and I started to walk in a circle. And here, all the things that I went through as a child came back to me. All the memories. I must have suppressed... Uh, suppressed them or something but suddenly all the things I remember my family my father and mother when they drank and how sometimes they left me alone and sometimes I would run to my grandmother's and stay with her uh, but when she died when I was 13 I had no one to go to so I walked in a circle because of the times I was alone and I was I was hungry and I was scared because there was nobody home with me. And I remembered all of these things and I seen the fights in my home. And all of these things, I walked in a circle and I cried all night, all the things that happened to me. And even the things that happened to our people, they came into my mind and I walked in a circle and I cried. And a voice came early in the morning before daylight and he said to me, he said, Hokshila, I said, boy, look to the south. He said, those are your people. So I looked and here there was a camp of people like long time ago. He said, these are your people and this is your ancestors and this is where they live now. So he said, remember this. Whenever you pray, he said, remember these people are behind you and are going to help you. He said. So I, I went through that day and it was very hot. It was like close to 100 degrees. And then that night, uh, I could feel strength from that first night of healing and of crying. And then I could, I noticed things more clear around me, the stars and the trees, and the birds and, and everything. And then on the, on that, on the second day, when, on the third day, it got really hot again. And I started to hallucinate and see things uh, from the heat. And I made it to that evening, and then I prayed throughout the night, and I could still see that camp over there of those people. And I, I prayed through the night, and then when, when morning came, uh, I heard a man singing someplace, but I don't know where he was at, what direction. And then I learned the song. And so the medicine man, my uncle, when I came down, he said, they said, the spirit said they give you a song. So I said, yes. Did you learn it? So I said, yes. And here he said, well, this is how you will communicate with them. So that's when uh, uh, I understood that the connection to the spirit world was, if you want to connect to them, that's where you have to go. 
is up on that humbleche up there. Uh, some people can get sick and connect with the spirits while they're really sick. That's how my grandfather, American Horse, did. So when his the spirits took him to a star, they call it Oe Hakala, that star. And up there was some people, they, there was bears, but they lived like people. They lived in teepees. They were, they were bears, but they, they lived like how we lived long ago. And they taught him songs. They taught him four songs, and they taught him how to doctor, and they showed him medicines. So that's how he became a healer. The next one is the making of relatives, hunkampi or hunkayapi. A ceremony of bringing, of bringing together or forging stronger relationship with others. This rite involves the giving and receiving of gifts, sharing food and smoke and conversation. It is best thought of as a way of bonding individuals or small groups into an extended family relationship. So, what it says is when you make relatives through this sacred ceremony, then you can't break it or you can't go back on it. So if someone, you take someone as a relative or someone takes you as a relative, they have to keep you as a relative as long as they're alive or as long as you're alive. Uh, when they say hunka means hunka is the ohunkanke, which is the ancestors. So ohunkayapi means you make relations with this person, but also his family and your ancestors also make relations in the spirit world. So that's why they say hunkayampi, oh, comes from the word ohunkanke, which means ancestors. So uh, ohunkanka, you remember, is the story of the ancestors are your relatives. So these stories are told at night now, like this time of the year. But we're ending that time now because once it's March 21st, then we move out of that time of Ohunkanka. Uh, so this is a, 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 a very powerful ritual in, the, in that you, uh, at one time, uh, at one time you see this altar of this man, and this man's name is Picket Pin, and he's smoking his pipe, and this is the altar of the Hunkan ceremony. So you see those wands there, those are horse tail. Those are, uh, those are horse tails that, that are tied on quilled sticks. And so long ago when they had the Hunkan ceremony, they would wave these wands over the people that are making relatives. Uh, so, but they don't use that now. Uh, now they combine the Hunkan ceremony with the naming ceremony. But at one time the Hunkan ceremony was held by itself. Uh, now they uh, make hunkan ceremony and naming ceremony, sometimes combine them. So now they use an eagle plume or a feather. If it's a male, it's a feather. If it's a female, it's a plume. And they just they, now they hold it to the six directions and then they tie it on. But at one time they wave those uh, those horsehair wands over the uh, the heads of the people making relative. And there's a song for that too. There's actually seven songs to the Hunkan ceremony, but they only use one now. You're not let, letting Melvin Minor in. <laughs> Preparing for womanhood, our puberty rite, Ishnati Awichalompi, the ceremony that marks the transition from girl to woman following her first menstrual period. It is a design to spiritually prepare the woman to take her rightful place in this community as a wife and a mother and to acknowledge her new adult role to the nation at large. So uh, in the time that the ceremony is happening, soon as they have their first menstrual flow, they, they put them in a teepee or a tent there's a, they're using a tent in this case here, but they used to use teepees, and we still and we use teepees today too. So that girl stays in there uh, for four days till her menstrual cleansing is done, and throughout that time she's uh, she has to work on some type of a, a project uh, like moccasins or maybe a belt or could be anything. 
maybe a, a purse or uh, those bags that you carry, those walk on your on your belt. Uh, but they say that uh, you have to finish what you're working on. If you don't finish your what you're working on during the sacred time, they said uh, you, everything in life after that you're going to give up on it. You're not going to finish anything. Uh, Unchis come in during the four days and give them uh, instructions on uh, how to be a proper Lakota woman. Uh, they plus they give them instructions on beading and quill work and they would talk to them about their role as a woman uh, in the future and how to be an honorable woman a woman that no one can talk about bad about no one can gossip about uh, long ago uh, whenever men and young girls uh, long ago they they were really strict in them dating so it was virtually unheard of for a young woman to enter into marriage and not be a virgin. But if somebody is not virtuous and a woman is promiscuous, these men would sing about her. So they would sing at night about this woman and uh, so that the people will know that she's not a virtuous woman. Uh, so. Uh, they say uh, to these young girls, Dohani Vichasha Onji Iniloa Kteshni, they say, a, woman, a man will never sing about you. See, they would tell them that that's part of their teaching. And then in one part of the ceremony, the spirit of Tatranka Ganashkiyar, the crazy buffalo, comes in, and a young man wears a buffalo headdress, and he comes in and he dances behind the woman that's going through the ceremony and they put sage on their lap each time he passes behind it. And uh, the reason they do this is they say someday the spirit of Tatranka Ganashkia will enter a young man and he'll try to entice you into having sex with him without you being married. Uh, so that ceremony was in place because there was a fear long ago that the buffalo will shy away from the people if there was promiscuous women in camp. So the buffalo won't come near, so the people will go hungry. That was the teaching. So they say, So they said, if there's women that are, that are in there that are not virtuous in a camp, the buffalo won't come close. So then, in turn, the pup, the people will, uh, the people will uh, starve, so, and especially the old people and the young people. So in this picture here, uh, the the young girl is inside the tent, and these uh, unchis are making bapa, and they, they take some into the camp. I mean, into the teep tent, and they show her how to make it. So uh, she she cuts she uh, cuts her own meat and makes bapa too. So during those four days, um, they take that first menstrual flow and they take it into a bundle, make it into a bundle with sage. They catch the first menstrual flow in a, on sage and then uh, right around the first, when she first does it, then they catch it and then put it in a bundle with tobacco and they put it in a plum tree, the fork of a plum tree. And they tell her to watch her dreams because sometimes during this sacred time, there's women that that will have a dream to be a medicine woman. And there's a story of a woman that during this time of her monthly cleansing and during this ceremony, um, a butterfly came into the teepee and landed on her uh, shoulder and talked to her in a real high-pitched voice and told her that, this butterfly said, we're going to give you dreams and we're going to teach you to be a medicine woman. So uh, she said she dreamed that night and this butterfly came as a beautiful woman and her buckskin, her dress was all quill work and all different beautiful colors and her face, her face was painted real beautiful. And she said, I'm the, I'm the person that's going to stay with you and help you when you doctor the people. So, uh, so uh, this is a sacred time in that they could, they could have that dream of being a medicine woman. Or they'll show you your future also. 
what you're going to be in life. Even They'll even show you how much children you're going to have. And then we have the Wing Wang Wachipi, the da dancing, look, looking at the sun is one of the greatest rites and was first held many, many winters ago after our people received a sacred pipe from the white buffalo cow woman, calf woman. It is held each year during the moon of fattening June or the moon of cherries blackening July. Always at the time when the moon is full for the growing and dying of the moon reminds us of our ignorance which comes and goes. So this is through this way is we see uh, a powerful and immense way of looking at life. So this tree you see represents life. There is a good to life and there is a bad to life. There's a balance to life. So when I conduct a ceremony in raising of the tree, uh, the women all have their offerings on one side of the limb and all the men have their offerings on the other side. They never put them together. And that's, that represents the balance of uh, the world, how there has to be a male and has, how there has to be a female together for life to uh, exist. So the bowl represents the woman and the stem represents the men the man. So you put them, join them together, then you have life. From it comes life. So by joining the pipe together, you have life. But by the man and woman joining together, then you have life also. So this is a, uh, this is a um, altar of the Nagi Owanka of the Nagi Gluhapi. So you see the Nuri Wasaglitron, the spirit post on the west side. So this is inside of a tipi. And then there's a Ptepka there. And then there's also a Chanopa, a sacred pipe leaning against that buffalo skull. And then the women sit on the north side and the men sit on the south side. And there's a fire in the center. So um, that little tipi sits on the other side of that uh, skull also. Uh, but that post is, is set there to where they tie the bundle onto. So when the ceremony is done, then that's when they tie the, uh, the spirit bundle on a teepee pole and they push it out of the top of the uh, teepee, out of the top of a teekja. Uh, so this is how the uh, altar is set. So the, in front of that um, buffalo skull is uh, all the food that's going to feed the spirit of the person because they're going to make their journey uh, across the Wanagi Trachanku when they leave from this world. Oh, so this is Nagi Gluhapi Hanta Tukteni Yapishni, stay isolated. Napik Chawotapi, eat with your hands. Mila Ilagyapishni, cannot use a knife. No loud talking or loud sudden noises. No disputes or arguing. And then this is the altar of one of the seven rites is the Thapa Wankal Yeyapi, the thr throwing of the ball ceremony. For this is for young girls. Uh, so. What they do is uh, they put sage in the center, and then sometimes they put a uh, they put a buffalo robe there, and then they make an altar of the skull, and then they have black offerings hanging here, red, yellow down here, and then white over here, a white wangyapi, a black wangyapi, a red wangyapi, and a yellow wangyapi. Uh, that's the proper the way proper way to say these. Uh, sacred offerings nowadays people just say flags i'm gonna i'm gonna make some flags for the ceremony but it's supposed to be why only that be so um and then you see the sacred ball right there and right by the buffalo skull it's it's a, a beaded ball and it's uh stuffed with buffalo hair so how the ceremony is conducted and this is one of the things that we lost so we have to adapt to it is we lost the song to this to this uh, ceremony so the young girl who's going through the ceremony she uh, 
she a group of girls would gather by this around here in this area where the black wall is. So she throws the ball to them and then they all try to catch it. And whoever catch it gets a blessing from the Wakin Oyate, from the Thunder people. And then she throws it, they throw it back to her and she throws it in this direction to the red Wa'unyapi. And there's a group of girls too. So each, each color of the direction has a different group of girls. So when she throws it to here and then whoever catches it, the young girl, then they uh, get blessings from the buffalo people, the Pte Oyate. And then they throw it back to her and then she throws it to the east. And then there's a group of girls here too. So they uh, get a blessing from the elk people, the Hechaka Oyate. And then they throw it back to her. And then she throws it to the, to the south, the white Wa'unyapi. And then they get a blessing from the Wa'unyapi. Oyate. The, all the animals, the four-legged, all the animals that live in our world. And they throw it back to the center like that. So she backs up to this entrance and she rolls that ball this way. If it rolls to the left, then uh, her firstborn child will be a, a male. If it rolls to the right, then her firstborn child will be a girl, a female. So that's how they determine that. Uh, her children and and so that's how the ceremony is done uh, so over here we have the wasana which they all they put some as an offering to the buffalo people and then there's champ uh, khampi that's uh, cherry juice that they offer to this the spirit of this buffalo and to all the uh, relatives that are there also partake of it and then they they offer some right here in front of the buffalo to this, uh, to our relatives that passed to, from this world and also uh, to the spirits that help us in the ceremony. Uh, so this, this came to a young uh, girl in a dream that these buffalo can't play with this ball and play with this, uh, play this game because they have hooves and they can't catch the ball. So they said, we'll give it to the two-legged and they could play the game for us. This. So that's how we received it. So this is some pictures of the balls that they used in the uh, ceremony. These are, there's still some among us that people have made because they've, their daughters have go, gone through this uh, ceremony. But these ones here, I got a picture from uh, uh, different uh, museums, but these are Lakota uh, balls that uh, that they use in the Kapa Wakaliapi. So I pretty much explained uh, what they do in the ceremony here on top, but I already explained that already. So in Lakota, it says, Le Ogunapte Oyate Biki Kichi Okijupi, yellow. So we make a relative to the Pte Oyate, the Buffalo people, by doing this ceremony, the young girls. So uh, I think it was two or three summers ago, I know we conducted this ceremony in the Black Hills with one of the uh, camps that we had up there with the young people. So that ceremony was done there. So this is uh, uh, Lakota Sundance Lodge. That's my cousin, older sister. Uh, she's blessing the food after the ceremony was over. So uh, they're putting tarps up on top so that the people could eat in the shade. But we don't use those tarps during the Sundance. This is after the Sundance ended. So Tkawachi Mojila, the ethics of our, uh, our people that we live by is, uh, the, in the ethics, it says Hechetushini, inappropriate to add on to someone's ceremony. Uh, stepping over food by women. And the reason is that the women carry a power so that if they step over food, they could make uh, males or children sick. Uh, this belief in ceremony. Trying to see the spirits. Uh, and then they say always to and set up your own ceremony. 
uh, a lot of times I've seen people come and bring tithes to somebody's ceremony and try to kind of like horn in on it when you should, uh, this family did the uh, offering of the pipe and got all the food ready and set up the time. And then you see people coming in kind of on their shirt tail and try to try to horn in on their ceremony. We uh, men serve the food uh, because we believe that uh, all of our lives, the women uh, feed us and take care of us. So at least at the ceremony, it's our turn to take care of them and, and uh, serve them. And it says, uh, it says, don't attend if you don't believe. And then Pata Wanjila Wachekapi, pray always with one mind. So there's a story about this woman that came to my uncle's ceremony and this, the spirits bothered and bothered her. So she wondered why she said, she said, why were they bothering me? So I got scared and I started praying and here they stopped bothering me. But what she didn't catch on to was the reason they were bothering her was she wasn't praying. She was looking around and trying to see, you know, things in the dark and like that. And she wasn't praying. So that's why they bothered her. Once she prayed, they let her alone. But I don't think she made a uh, connection. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the rules of the pipe is uh, in under the opagi or the offering of the pipe, it says, Dwani opagi wanji yuha kami greshni. So when you take a when you're taking a sacred pipe to offer, one cannot turn back. So if you take an uh, offering to a holy man or a healer and he's not home, you, you have to smoke that pipe before you turn around with it and go home with it. You can't take that loaded pipe back home. Uh, so so you, uh, if he's there and he smokes it, then that's the way it's supposed to be. But if he's not there, then... Lakota look at it as it wasn't meant to be. So smoke your pipe and go home and then maybe come another day like that. Uh, before you, before offering a sacred pipe, one, one must tell the request. Uh, you tell them why, what you want and why you're bringing him the pipe. And it says, Chihanta Ichuk Dishni, Wakan Yeska has a right to refuse. So uh, the reason that is, is he might see that something is not right. Maybe the prayers uh, uh, are not good. Uh, I've seen a, a woman once came to my uncle and was going to offer a pipe to him. And he said, no. He said, yeah. And, he, and he, so she didn't offer the pipe. And he said, I can't help you. So um, she left, but she seemed kind of upset, but she left. So I said, why didn't you get it in here? He said, because she was gonna want me to she was gonna want me to pray against her son-in-law. And they already warned me about her coming. He said, Never walk in front of someone smoking a sacred pipe. I've seen that happen a lot of times. One time I was smoking a pipe or offering down at the Inipi, the sweat life. And this guy who should know better, an older man, came, walked right up to me and tried to shake my hand. But I ignored him and I continued to smoke the pipe. And when I got done, I gave the pipe back to this person. And that guy pouted and he went home. He pouted because he thought that I deliberately uh, snubbed him or whatever, you know. But I was smoking that pipe, so he shouldn't uh, shouldn't have even approached me. And the chanopaki echela topa kingle kigle ayuratapi. Sacred pipe alone is offered four times. I've seen people offer me tobacco like a cigarette four times. But that does not, a cigarette does not, is not on the same level as a sacred pipe. Uh, only a sacred pipe is offered four times because of the four sacred laws of the Chinupa. So there's no four, four sacred laws to a cigarette. Chinupa un opagipi ki echela imoyatachi. 
So offering, the sacred pipe offering is the most sacred and binding. So uh, this happened to me with a lady. She came and she gave me a handful of tobacco in my hand and said, can you come tomorrow to Rapid City to pray because we're going to have a walk. So I said, okay. And I took the tobacco and I put it in the fire of the Inipi. And then we went into the Inipi. Next morning, a lady came with a pipe and offered it to me. So I took her pipe. I didn't go to that walk. I stayed home, had an Inipi. And that night I held a low umpi ceremony for this woman. So this lady called me back and said, why didn't you come? You took the tobacco. So I said, a sacred pipe takes precedence over a handful of tobacco or a cigarette. So I said, if you really wanted me to come, you should have offered me a chanupas. Then I would have been bound to come. That's binding. I said, more binding than a handful of tobacco or a cigarette. So that people need to understand that. So when you offer a chanli, a cigarette, don't offer it four times. It's not on the level of a chanupa. So in our lives, only Yamani, we have three domains in our life. Around us is taku wakhan, what is sacred. And then there's the taku waikja, what is common. And then mie, our place in the universe. So how do we, and you notice I made these circles all interconnected because they're all part of each other. They're all part of each other. So you live in this world and you live in this world and you live in your world. Sometimes we confuse these worlds together, sometimes. So sometimes we will take taku wakha and we will make it taku waikja, what is common. Or we'll take something that, that is taku waikja and make it taku wakha. So uh, I don't know if that makes sense to people, but we've, I see that a lot, you know. And one of the prophecies of uh, in the uh, creation stories is in towards towards that there's gonna come a time they said in the future, and we're living through that time now. And in that prophecy, it says, "What is right will be wrong, and what is wrong will become right." So we're seeing that if you think about it, it's all around us in the world. You know what what we think a lot of times are what was. What is considered right is sometimes wrong, and what is wrong is considered right. And that happen, that's happening all the time. So how you yourself as a person, how you interact in this world is determines what type of a life you live in this world. Do, do you keep that sacred? Do you keep that holy? And then the taku wa do you know to separate the two? And you know how to live in that world also, the common everyday world. So whenever, whenever, uh, if you was to take the calf pipe, the sacred, no most sacred object of the Lakota people, and you put it on display, you show it on a movie, you show it on, on TV, it, be, it will become from Taku Wakhan to Taku Waikcha, it will become common. Because every person in, in the, across this world will see it. And when this woman brought the sacred pipe, she said, this calf pipe, she said, only the good people will see it. But out there, there's a lot of people that, that, are, not, <laughs> that are not good people. I have my own applause. <laughs> So uh, that's that's an example of of, uh, of why people frown on uh, showing a lot of things, you know, that uh, there's even controversy uh, about uh, some old men said, uh, we haven't seen the cow pipe for years and years. So they hounded uh, Orville Looking Horse to um, show the pipe to them. And, and, and he said, he kept saying, uh, you have to be ready. You have to be worthy. Not just anybody can see it, just to prove that it's there. So uh, that's that's one of the things you know that that people aren't taking into consideration. 
sorry about the applause, but I put that in there because somebody will clap for me. <laughs> so we went 10 minutes over, Toja. I'm clapping for you, Lexi. Oh, all right. <laughs> Lots of people are clapping for you. Thank you so very much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome.